Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Kevin Thompson, and I'm the director for Transportation for America. I just wanted to welcome you this afternoon. Um, for those who are, who are in the afternoon, if you're joining us on the West Coast, uh, late good morning to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to give you a, a, a little overview about Transportation for America before we jump into our program today. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, this is our 10th year. We were started by um, the uh, Rockefeller uh, Foundation uh, 10 years ago, really to be a catalyst for transportation reform. Um, and over time, we have uh, grown into quite a big organization, um, really focused on advocacy and technical assistance and thought leadership um, in, uh, uh, in the transportation space. Um, we have a, um, a pretty uh, robust um, advocacy effort going on this year um, uh, related to um, the defense of transit uh, programs at the federal level, um, and several cities are participating in that. We have a, a Smart Cities uh, Collaborative that uh, more than 24 cities are currently participating in as um, cities gear up to sort of deal with the um, changing landscape of transportation in the United States. That now includes uh, the possibility of uh, automated vehicles and, and certainly TNCs and other sorts of um, uh, micro-mobility um, um, uh, uh, vehicles like uh, scooters and bikes and, and, the, and the like. Um, we, um, we, we also have the Arts and Cultures Program, which you uh, are going to hear much about today. Um, and you're, and, and uh, Ben Stone, who is the Director uh, for Arts and Culture, will be talking about our Three C's Program. And um, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. And certainly, if you have any questions about uh, Transportation for America, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us. We'd be happy to answer those. I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Ben Stone. Um, our Director for Arts and Culture. Thank you, Kevin. Um, hi, everybody. This is Ben Stone, Director of Arts and Culture for Transportation for America. Thank you, everybody who's joining us live today and all the future people who are listening to this recording sometime in the future. I'm going to give just a really quick introduction to the Arts and Culture team and our Cultural Corridor Consortium, or 3C program, before we hand things off to the folks in Dothan, India, and Los Angeles to tell you about the work they've been doing over the last year. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been running as our real signature arts and culture program, this Cultural Corridor Consortium. That's the last time I'll say that mouthful, the 3C program in six cities around the country. Um, some of you might have tuned into past webinars and heard about the work we did and supported in Portland, San Diego, and Nashville. We're not going to go into too much detail about that, but I will touch on that just a little bit in just a moment. And of course, we've been working and supporting the great work happening in Indy, Dothan, and Los Angeles just over the last year. Um, this work is really in addition to work we've been doing to support our Complete Streets team, support our economic development work, and a whole bunch of other programs and projects across Smart Growth America. And you can always tune into future webinars to hear all about that work. Um, for today, we're going to, of course, going to talk about the 3C program. And if you haven't tuned into our past webinars or read about our past reports from past projects, I just wanted to quickly let you know that in the last couple of years, we've supported projects in Port Portland and East Portland along uh, Division, right around 82nd Street in the Jade and Division Midway districts, where we really supported a number of community-based organizations to bring people together and talk about the future of this incredibly diverse and fairly affordable corridor that's rapidly changing to help people figure out how the uh, creation of a bus rapid transit line could be uh, expanded and its goals could be expanded to support affordable housing and other kinds of important activities in East Portland. In San Diego, we focused on the Somali community in the um, City Heights neighborhood and supported the build out of a community gathering space and as well a bus rapid transit system there. And then in Nashville, Tennessee, we've been working and supporting work in the fastest growing, in, fastest growing immigrant community in the United States, Nolensville Pike, just south of downtown, and have been trying to support the efforts to make this corridor safer, reduce a ridiculously high rate of pedestrian fatalities, and helping to create a staffed organization to organize the Kurdish community, as well as supporting their um, a build out of a public space as well. Um, we're, of course, going to hear about the three cities I just mentioned. Um, we have quite a few speakers. I'm not going to introduce everybody. 
Uh, you're looking at a screen now of everybody is going to speak. That's me in the top left. You just heard from Kevin. Um, so without further ado, I am going to hand things off to Bob Wilkerson with the city of Dothan, Alabama to get us started. So Bob, please take it away. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> well, I am Bob Wilkerson and uh, with the city of Dothan, I'm the um, long-range planner and uh, urban design uh, project specialist for the city of Dothan. Uh, Dana Marie Lemmer is our partner in this project. Uh, Dana is the curator and director of the Wiregrass Museum of Art. She was unfortunately not able to be with us today. She has a very important um, accreditation visit going on uh, for the museum, so um, we will um, do this without her wonderful input. But I would encourage all of you to uh, take a look at her website, um, WMA, uh, Wiregrass Museum of Art um, in Dothan. It's, um, it's an incredible institution doing incredible things in the realm of uh, outreach and uh, community engagement. Uh, next. Can we get the next slide? Okay. Um, <clears throat> this graphic uh, gives you a little bit of orientation. Um, the East Main, the road that's uh, um, uh, captioned East Main is actually Highway 84. Um, th this graphic was done by a very talented intern that we had from Auburn University. Her name is Hanay Ajade, and uh, she is a, was a triple uh, master's major in landscape architecture industrial design and community planning. And this was sort of prior to the beginning of the Highway 84 corridor um, project. <clears throat> and what she did was sort of mapped desire lines in our downtown, in our historic downtown area, and matching up people with places that they need to uh, access for goods and services. So. As you can see, there's a lot of crossing over uh, East Main Street, which is also, as I said, Highway 84. And so you begin to see that we have a tremendous amount of traversing of this, of this highway. So next. Uh, just for a little context, uh, we're a, a population of about 68,000. That was a 2010 census. We are, uh, however, a regional market on a daily basis. Uh, we reach, uh, have a reach of about 600,000 people uh, in southeast Alabama, in the panhandle of Florida, and in southwest Georgia. And we are uh, primarily a medical and retail services um, economy. And the medical portion of the economy is quickly uh, becoming king. But you can also see our proximity to Atlanta, uh, to Nashville, very close pro proximity to Panama City and the Gulf Coast, and to uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Next. And also, just to give you a, another sense of the importance of this roadway, it is the primary east-west uh, connector across the city. Um, <clears throat> Ross Clark Circle that surrounds Dothan was actually the first ring road in the United States, the first completed ring road in 1958, and it's had a, a very profound uh, impact on our development. And of course, uh, it's typical to many cities, uh, sort of an urban sprawl away from the, the center, uh, leaving a lot of issues of concern inside the circle. Uh, but you can see there in the um, sort of gold or tan uh, color that is the uh, project study area. So it's quite a, a large um, area uh, for this particular planning study. Next. Okay, so here's here's our real challenge in Dothan. We are a uh, relatively small city, but we are growing. As I said, we have this uh, sort of booming regional um, medical um, uh, market draw that uh, is, is creating a lot of congestion around our medical centers, uh, which are located on either ends of Highway 84. Uh, we're a very auto-centric community. 
We have virtually no infrastructure for pedestrians, uh, no infrastructure for cyclists. Um, we have developed in a very uh, environmentally insensitive manner along this corridor, lots of concrete, lots of asphalt. We're an aesthetic disaster, and um, it's also a transportation management disaster. And so those were the things that we set out to focus upon when we began this journey of looking at the Highway 84 corridor. Next. So we see possibilities, and this was our early visioning. Of course, we would love to see dedicated bicycle and pedestrian lanes. We'd love to see green infrastructure, as in the upper right-hand corner, the fourth ward in Atlanta, uh, such a wonderful stormwater remediation and environmental um, uh, sort of innovation in that part of the city. Uh, complete streets, we have a very appropriately scaled streets in our downtown that would make for very, very good um, human connection spaces, uh, bicycle and pedestrian crossings in the form of, of bridges, but also um, marked and signaled crossings and then mixed use development. So those were a collection of the things that we were trying to accomplish through the 84 plan. Next. So along with that, we, we saw a lot of opportunities, and so we began to have a conversation locally that um, if we were going to approach um, aesthetic issues that we needed to take a world-class sort of view, uh, why not? Why, why can't these things be in a place like Dothan, Alabama, just as they are in the larger and, and more populous cities? And so we begin to see the infusion of arts and um, artistic problem solving as a as a component to um, to to what we were working with here. Next. So we hired initially um, a um, a national design team, design workshop out of Houston. Uh, we hired them to develop the corridor plan, um, and so we began that with a series of workshops, um, such as the one you see advertised here back in January, and we had um, some good participation. Next. And as you can see, the room is, is a fairly, um, I guess, homogeneous uh, collection of people. If you were a local here, you would know um, many of the folks that were here were sort of the ones that always show up for these kind of meetings. They're always engaged and always interested in what's going on in, in the community. But f from that, we were very disappointed, even though um, at this particular meeting that you see on the screen we had uh, roughly 100 people. Um, that's a very good turnout for any public meeting anywhere in the country, and certainly in a in a smaller uh, community, a smaller city. But we did not see the diversity, and we did not see the rep representation of uh, various populations in in that in that meeting or the or the subsequent meeting that followed. Uh, next. So here's, here's the real problem that we were concerned about. <clears throat> um, the yellow dot at the bottom of the screen is uh, a grocery store that all of the residents of this area that's outlined in red um, must access to, to sustain. I mean, it, it is their source of, of fresh food. And so the light blue line across the bottom of the screen is Highway 84, and as you can see, all of those people must cross that roadway. Um, there are no designated crossings on that roadway. Uh, it's, it's a very dangerous situation. It's something that we as city officials have observed on a very frequent basis. So we were very concerned that our efforts to uh, encourage people to come into this process were, were actually not responding to, to the call. So it was either the message or it was either the fact that 
these people, because they're disadvantaged, felt like the message was not really intended for them. Next. So you can see uh, here just quickly the, the, the problem that these people encounter, a six-lane highway uh, with no crosswalks, and, of course, you have very high speeds. Next. Another view, this is in the hospital is in the background. There's a lot of retail on either sides of the street. Um, there are no sig there there are no designated cross points, and there are um, no designated lanes for cyclists. So it's a very makes for a very difficult situation for people to uh, traverse the area. Next. So what we did about the time that we um, uh, learned of the work of the Cultural Court of Consortium, uh, we decided to form a partnership with the uh, Wiregrass Museum of Art. And we also had some support from the Dothan Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so we formed this partnership with the museum and uh, decided that we would try to address this problem um, in, a, in a different kind of, of manner than we had in the past. Next. So as I said, Dana Marie Lemmer was our, uh, is our curator and uh, principal partner in this, in this project. And what we decided was that with the help of um, Transportation for America that we would um, procure an artist to look at the situation, to look at our concerns, and not so much from the standpoint of trying to inject some form of public art, but from the standpoint of trying to have an impact on the uh, sort of um, social uh, dynamic or paradigm and how we might be able to reach uh, these disadvantaged populations to join in our process. Next. So Dana put out a call for artists, and um, we we had a huge roster to to select from. Uh, we selected this gentleman, Cosby Hayes, who is uh, who has become our artist in residence. Uh, Cosby is a well-known artist in the Tallahassee, Florida area. His uh, expertise is is in actually graffiti art and um, other forms of public art. A uh, very talented. Um, gentleman who was very interested in in seeing if he could approach um, this this problem as a sort of a boots on the ground in the neighborhoods outreach uh, to see if that could impact um, how, the, the kind of response that we would get. Next. So we did <clears throat> um, have a very good result from from his effort. Um, so we begin to hear the voices of the people that are dependent upon this this roadway. So we, <coughs> excuse me, we um, believe that one of the the outcomes of this project is that we have certainly discovered that art is is a very strong medium for invoking trust among disadvantaged populations. And as you can see. Um, uh, Cosby was able to um, encourage and um, get commitment from people to even come and sit down and have discussions um, about that at different times. Next. Uh, Cosby and our videographer went out and did um, an awful lot of interviews, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, very labor-intensive, time-intensive, but, but a very impactful result. Um, this particular lady, uh, along with others, agreed to go on camera, and they were included in our video. But this lady was expressing um, the concern of trying to get across Highway 84 and how difficult it is and how frightening it is and the fact that even it seems like at times people um, almost try to harm someone who is trying to uh, get across the highway as if they're doing something wrong. And so very powerful stories that were uh, chronicled um, in this process. Next. Just another example of the documentation that 
uh, Cosby was able to take of people trying to get across these um, very um, large, um, busy highways in the area. Next. Fortunately, we, we have another voice in the process, and that is some very good support from our city leaders, uh, Mayor Mark Saliba, uh, is a longtime Dothan resident. Um, he's new to the mayor's office, but he has been incredibly supportive of this pro project, and that has had a tremendous impact on how our efforts are viewed within the city. And he's also very uh, pro on the partnership relationship that we formed with the Museum of Art, um, which hopefully signals that we'll be able to duplicate these efforts uh, in the future. Next. Uh, this is one of our city commissioners, Beth Kenward. Um, she's another strong voice in the community. You see her there holding a public meeting uh, that she invited uh, uh, Cosby Hayes to attend and explain uh, the program and what we're trying to do. Uh, interestingly, this corridor is not in, in Beth's district, um, but she really understood the the plight of those that have to use this roadway for uh, sustainable to be able to sustain their life and so she really went out of her way to bring that message to another demographic in the town which is the um the constituency that she represents next We, we heard voices from the business community. Uh, Cosby interviewed a lot of our downtown businesses. Um, Ms. Holzmer and her husband have recently opened, opened a, uh, a coffee roasting and uh, you know, coffee shop. Um, and they've renovated a, a building in uh, downtown Dothan, and they live above and have a thriving business below. Uh, so uh, the business community has concerns about how people get across the roadway and um, the, the traffic, speeds of the traffic and those types of things, the safety along the roadway that impacts their business as well. So we heard from those folks too. Next. Uh, we have about one minute left. Okay. We. Um, we also heard from the uh, professional community uh, who utilized the, the roadway for a different purpose. We can go next. Um, these are some of the studies that were done. Next. And go on to the next. All right, this begins to be the results that has come or, or is coming from uh, the investment in our community. These are some of the viable alternatives that we will be looking at to, to uh, implement in the future. Next. Um, this is just another part of the work that's being done that shows a lot of changes to the system and how we're trying to slow it down with a roundabout, crossings, and a, a, a a host of other elements. Next. So we're done. Great. Thank you so okay, much, Dan. Bob. That was great. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in. We'll get to questions hopefully at the end with the time we have left. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move straight on over to Kelly Mergo with Transit Drives Indy to tell us about the story in Indianapolis. So Kelly, please take it away. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelly Mergo. I am with Transit Drives Indy. I'm the project manager for 3C Indy Indianapolis. Uh, Transit Drives Indy is a coalition of individuals, businesses, and organizations who've been working together really since 2015 to educate and advocate on behalf of public transportation uh, improvements in Marion County. Uh, my partner in this project and on this call is Julia Mooney Moore with the Arts Council of Indianapolis. Um, I'll let her introduce herself a little bit more when it's her turn to talk. Um, so just a little context about our pro uh, project. So in response to the 2016 successful uh, referendum passage here in Marion County, um, on November 8th, 60% of our voters in Marion County said that they wanted an improved public transportation system. 
So after decades uh, of planning, our um, a new a new system was created and presented and approved. Um, it is the Marion County Transit Plan. So Transit Drives Indy played a key role on a grassroots level to get out into the neighborhoods in Marion County to educate on behalf of this system. What does it mean? What is it going to look like? What, how will it impact you as a writer or as a non-writer? What are the benefits? Um, and while we were successful with the passage and we're very uh, appreciative of that, one of the things that we did know is that there was still work to be done in education. Um, I cannot tell you and have said it several times that no matter how many meetings that I was in and if I asked if people had heard of the Marion County Transit Plan, um, a lot of people didn't raise their hands. <laughs> Sometimes over half the people in the room didn't. So in response to the successful passage, um, Transit Drives Indy and the Arts Council of Indianapolis, along with some of our partner organizations that you see here, um, talked about how we could create a new culture of public transit, and more importantly, how can we activate artists and communities into this transit education, into the transit conversation. And so our goals are really to educate, engage, promote, and monitor throughout the implementation of the Marion County Transit Plan. Just to give you some context of the Marion County Transit Plan, on the left there you see what our current system has looked like. And when we might think times that green is good, actually green is very bad here. The majority of our system in Indianapolis is, um, is over a 60 minute wait, our transit system. So our riders are um, on average waiting over 60 minutes for a bus. And I will say also to give another point of context about our transit system here is our city limits are, are our county limits, so our, our system has to serve the entire county. Um, so on the right side of the screen is um, the Marion County Transit Plan service map. Um, and what it does is it represents a 70% increase in frequency. Um, right now our bus systems don't run on Sundays. We, do, we have inconsistent hours, so it will run, every route will run every day um, with extended service hours. Um, and what we wanted to do with our 3C Indy project, because one of the biggest things coming out of the Marion County Transit Plan is that Indianapolis will have three bus rapid transit lines as part of this system. And that's kind of, that's what we wanted to uh, focus on with 3C Indy. So the first line which will be constructed and actually is in construction right now is the red line. Um, it is a uh, 13 miles, it has 28 stations. It is one of the most dense and diverse areas. Um, and a lot of why the red line, this particular corridor was selected because of its access to um, employers. Uh, along this 13 mile stretch, there are nearly 150,000 employers. So 150,000 businesses or companies or whatnot that have opportunities for, um, for jobs. So that was one of the reasons why the red line was selected. Um, along the red line, you also have opportunities for a lot of our uh, cultural districts, connections to cultural districts and attractions. You'll see some images of, of um, places and destinations and communities where riders and non-riders can, they can use the red line now to access much more frequently. The other bus, bus rapid transit line that we wanted to focus on with 3C Indy was the purple line. It is number two in, um, in terms of uh, construction. Um, and it actually is really unique because it connects, it's a 14 mile, uh, roughly around 14 mile stretch. It, it actually connects two separate municipalities. 61% um, of this, of uh, the population along the purple line corridor is non-white, 30% are in poverty. So this is also a very interesting and unique corridor just because of the population that it represents, the population that it serves, but also of how um, just the connection between Indianapolis as well as the city of Lawrence. So once uh, Indianapolis was awarded the 3C grant, we started to talk about what the goals of this, how could we use our artists and our, our, our communities and our, uh, the voices of our writers um, and in, in this program. Um, and so in October of 2017, we released a call to artists um, where we wanted the artists to actually focus on projects that um, engage residents and communities along the red and purple rapid transit line, inspire enthusiasm and future ridership. We want to definitely use arts as a vehicle for engagement and education, and we want to initiate place-based events and installations to mitigate construction impact. Um, and so like I said, so we started that we had the call to artists release in um, 2017, October. And by January, we were working with six um, artists, uh, some of them individual artists, some of them representing arts organizations. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Julia to talk about our artists and our projects. 
Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Julia Moore. I'm the Director of Public Art at the Arts Council of Indianapolis, and I'm um, very, very happy to have been uh, involved on behalf of the Arts Council um, with the 3C Indie program. Um, so I'm going to start with the purple line. Um, the purple line um, was the line that was a little bit less developed. It's still in the design phase, so there's plenty of opportunity for an artist to um, engage the public and get their opinions to actually um, involve them in the design of the line. Um, our artist um, was an urban designer and planning company um, called uh, With Purpose, and uh, it's led by Will Marquez and his associate Alejandro Lagunas. Um, were the main people associated with this. So they worked um, a lot of times in, right in tandem with our transit agency, Indigo. Um, to They were there at almost all of the public meetings that Indigo went to and then uh, on their own uh, with purpose went to um, a number of neighborhood organizations and community events and set up a table and they uh, their engagement um, vehicle were these purple pinwheels, and so they called it the Purple Pinwheel Project. And it really was an icebreaker with the community where people could sit and they could talk about transit and they could make these pinwheels. They could take the pinwheels with them and take them home or put them in their business window. Um, they could also, the um, With Purpose team also created a number of these installations like you see on the lower right um, in front of key um, places and nodes in the community and um, as it happens that uh, the width of that installation is probably about maybe a third uh, of what the um, actual um, transit stop will be. It will be a, a really, really giant stop. Um, and that helps people envision the size of what the stop would be. And it's very eye-catching because obviously this is not a video, but though it is a pinwheel, so those wheels um, spin all the time. So we have people um, talking about transit, um, making pinwheels, making the big pinwheels, making small pinwheels, and also engaging um, with each other to talk about transit in a very non-threatening, fun way that actually gets people to talk. Uh, these um, people uh, the, with purpose went to community organizations instead of expecting the community organization communities to members to come to public meetings, which may be inconvenient or you know just they felt that it wasn't for them. Um, and it's been a, a really wonderful project. I just went to um, they just had their last event uh, on Saturday where they spoke to a group of seniors in a um, public park. Uh, it was really really fun. <laughs> So um, they were doing a lot of great work. And then all the rest of the artists I'm going to talk about have been working with the red line. And as Kelly mentioned, uh, the red line is already in construction, so it's already been designed. Um, the original goal um, with the red line was to help people kind of live through the probably painful construction period um, because of federal funding situations, the funding was not released until probably about five months later than we thought it was going to be. So we had to very quickly um, pivot to uh, talking more about um, education about the red line and less about mitigating construction impacts. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the organization Big Car Collaborative um, is working with the southern uh, three stops or four stops. Um, the southern end of the red line. This is where they're located. This is where they know the community the best. And so they've they staged a number of uh, engagement events, and you're, you're seeing a couple of them. On the lower left uh, was an artisan fair at the University of Indianapolis. The lower right, they had a movie night behind the Safeway near where a stop is going to be, where they showed an Evil Can Evil jumping buses <laughs> movie, and then they also showed um, the uh, a, a Japanese animation film that kind of centers the around a bus stop. Um, and so they've been performing these engagement events to um, talk to people about their ideas and um, memories and uh, emotional feelings about their neighborhood, which Big Car is in the process of translating uh, to some uh, site-specific installations that um, let people know where they can go uh, in the uh, area and not just where they can go you know, sight why you know sightseeing, but you know, also gives this experiential feel of what the neighborhood is like. So it supports residents' opinions as well as um, helps visitors uh, understand where they are and what they can find there. 
Um, Jamie Paulus is uh, engaging a stop in Fountain Square, um, which is a, a very popular kind of um, arts and entertainment district near the southern end of the red line. Um, and she decided, she, Jamie had never ridden the bus before in Indianapolis, although she always rides public transit wherever she goes, and she realized this was a complete lack on her part. And she thought it was because, you know, she didn't know, you know, where to catch the bus and, you know, where it would take her and really how often it would come. So she felt a lot of people were in that same um, position, and she designed an installation called Coming Soon Seriously. Um, which really speaks to the fact that um, not only will there be much more frequent transit, um, that the red line itself is coming soon, and then the seriously, we've been talking about bus rapid transit for such a long time here, and people never believed it was going to happen. Um, and then the seriously is her, her way of saying, you know, yeah, it's, it's really going to happen. So this piece is actually um, being installed tomorrow morning, and we're very, very happy about that. Um, and, we're, and there is a sound element that's still being designed that um, is uh, in process. That will be installed at some point, probably um, early part of next year. Um, another one of our artists is the Sapphire Theatre Company. Um, this is not a traditional theatre company. Um, they are uh, very engaged in using theatre to explore community issues and community concerns. Um, and they decided to um, create a video um, to give everybody the idea of what um, the red line, um, what, what riding the red line could be. This is a route that doesn't exist. Um, the purple line, by contrast, is a bus line that already exists. It's just going to be upgraded to a rapid transit. This is a new line going new places and new stops where no buses had gone before. And so they wanted to kind of give a, a shorthand version of the experience of riding the red line. So they worked with Indigo. They commissioned a bus, and um, they filmed uh, put using GoPro cameras, uh, put them on the front of the bus, and was able to capture through several iterations a, you know, an, idea, an idea of where people could, would go, what they could see, and what riding the red line um, would feel like on what they would consider a perfect day. And I've provided a link to the final video so that anyone can do it. I'm not going to show it right now, but um, it's about uh, six minutes long, and it's really very fun, and it really gives you a feeling of what riding through the city on the red line um, would feel like. Andrea Smith is an artist uh, who's um, primarily um, photography, and she um, in a, it, and is a total opposite from Jamie Paulus. Um, Andrea um, grew up um, transit dependent in Indianapolis and right along uh, what is now going to be the Red Line Corridor. So she was very, very excited about this, and she was very excited about the idea that you know, she grew up knowing that she could take the bus anywhere and that she was very interested in conveying that to people. So she um, researched um, how long it would take from um, place to place on the red line, um, and she used her signature style. She is a very good photographer of children, so she took these original um, studio and on-site uh, portraits of children to help draw attention to the fact that you could ride the red line to very specific destinations. You can get fresh food uh, and be there in 10 minutes. And for where she placed that particular door, um, this is very important because that area is considered a food desert. And with the red line, you can actually get to fresh food on public transit in a very, very fast 10 minutes. Um, so she called them doors to transit, and these are actual doors that she purchased um, that, um, because it's almost like opening the door to a new life um, on the red line. And um, finally, Carlos Sosa is our fifth red line artist, and he is um, doing a poetry project. He is um, visiting a number of community locations and um, promoting the fact that people can come. He has poetry coaches there to help them write poetry about their own transit experience. And he's using the meter of the um, Maya Angelou poem, Still I Rise, um, to uh, create a, a, a poem called Still I Ride, 
um, about the um, what she likes. What, what sorry, what each individual likes about riding uh, the bus. And he's also taking portraits of the people who are writing the poems. And he's going to create a booklet um, and also a series of posters to place in businesses all up and down the red line that talk about um, the positive uh, aspects of the transit experience. And so this is to help people envision that they too could be one of these uh, riders. Okay, so um, the, uh, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes, dear. We'll, we'll we'll tag team on this one. Um, so the uh, today we have uh, presented over 20 events, um, installations, and direct, directly engaged 300 plus writers and non-writers. Um, so some of the reflections and lessons learned, capacity um, definitely at the top of the list in terms of administrative, you know, on the admin side of things as well as for the artists. Um, I think that one of the things that we had to do is um, at the beginning was spend a lot of time with our artists educating um, uh, the artists and getting them to understand the new system. Um, so there was quite a bit of education that was required um, for them to even be able to go out and, and talk with the community members and, and, and whatnot and engage in a conversation about the transit. They didn't have to be experts on it, but they, you know, most of our um, most of our artists, some of our artists didn't didn't know anything about it, as Julia had alluded to. One of them hadn't even been on the uh, had never been on the bus. Um, capacity on the admin side, I think everybody on this call struggles with that, so I don't need to expand <laughs> on um, admin capacity challenges. Um, as Julia mentioned, our construction schedule um, challenges. We had uh, had hoped that one of our initial goals was to create programs and events and installations that would mitigate construction, communicate to the, um, the public about these changes as well as to promote small businesses open during construction, but because of the challenges with scheduling, we were not able to do that. Um, as you can see, uh, I hope that it is, it's interesting to see it in, a, in these slides, um, but it is a lot of work that we did um, and working with six artists over this time period. Um, in, you know, besides, I think, Jamie, I mean, all of these artists actually did multiple projects themselves. Um, so. One thing that we did realize is even though I'm very proud that we have been able to deliver, um, less is sometimes more. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it, it, looking back, maybe we would have engaged um, uh, fewer artists, maybe focused on a particular neighborhood or a community along the red line. Um, and um, so that, was, that, that, that might have been um, something that was helpful. Julia? Yeah, um, we had to um, think really, really carefully about the definition of engagement and um, to understand that engagement is really defined by uh, not so much us, but defined by the people being engaged. Um, and to think about, you know, what can we do to um, help people and um, just the fact that people aren't actually out there um, creating something doesn't mean that uh, they're not being engaged. So we had to be very creative about thinking uh, on the artist side, um, what can they do that is very true to what the artists do, but also engage people in a way that's not defined by the artist, but that's more defined um, by the viewer. Um, we also had to, again, with the construction challenges, we had to be really ready to pivot what we can do and to understand what we can and can't do and what was within our control and what was not within our control. Um, and that was a very interesting experience. And then we also learned um, that we needed to document everything. Um, and we set up an Instagram account um, that's called 3C um, underscore Indie. Um, and that we're trying to collect a lot of the documentation and to encourage um, all of our artists to collect their documentation in that location so that we can go back and refer to it and um, pull from it because in this world, unfortunately, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. So, Kelly, you want to talk about this or you want me to? You go ahead. Hon. And you both have about one minute left. Okay. Um, so the next thing okay. we're – Okay, so these are the next things that we're going to do. Um, our project continues until the end of the year, um, so we are going to be thinking about um, what we can do on the red line um, the next step after the construction is completed and how we can involve artists in uh, some more permanent pieces um, and also some uh, interventions with the community um, having to do with art and then actually physically on the buses. So to continue that with the red line. And the reason we have to wait for that is because um, I 
I'm sure a lot of people on this call are very much aware that because of the federal funding, we cannot put art uh, there until the federal, um, the federally funded project is complete, signed, sealed, delivered, and done. Um, the next step on the purple line is we are looking at um, an event called that we're calling the purpling, where we're going to take the entire course of the purple line, which a lot of people don't really um, understand where it is, and to turn it purple. So with um, lights and uh, purple things and signs and banners and pinwheels and just really go the entire 14 miles uh, course of the purple line and make it purple and obvious to let people know, yeah, this is where the line is going to go. Um, we're also looking ahead to our third um, bus rapid transit line, which is the blue line, and looking at implementing artists and residents to do something very similar um, to what uh, With Purpose did with the purple line, um, to do that community engagement, to do that feedback, get it back to the designers, and make sure that um, not just the line itself, but um, a lot of the community improvements, uh, such as sidewalks and crosswalks, are really going to help people, um, not just to, to help people connect from their neighborhoods to transit in a safe um, and effective way. And then the fourth thing that we're talking about with Indigo is there are a number of places um, in the transit system um, where that they're calling super stops, where it's where it's a stop that serves um, so many bus lines that they're going to be making those into something a little bit special. They're not quite rapid. They're not rapid transit sites, but they are um, regular um, local line super stops and to how, how we can engage artists to um, make those super stops special. That's it. Great. Thank you, Julia and Kelly. Um, I'm going to hand things off to Karen Mack in Los Angeles with LA Commons to bring us home. So Karen, please take it away. Hi everyone, uh, this is Karen Mack in Los Angeles, which is an exceptionally vibrant city of 4 million people, um, filled with diverse locals as well as transplants from around the country and the world who bring their culture and ideas uh, to our 96 neighborhoods and over 500 square miles. Um, in addition to sheer size, our challenges include housing affordability, like many places around the country these days, and transit, which luckily Metro is working hard to address. And today you'll hear from Zipporah Yamamoto, who is Director of Art and Design at Metro, and she'll talk more about what's happening uh, with the lines around the city. Our project is focused on one of LA's neighborhoods, Hyde Park, which is actually one of the city's oldest places. Um, in uh, the early 20th century, it was its own city and has a history as a major transportation hub on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe lines. Today, it sits squarely in the um, heart of African American Los Angeles. Um, and, um, and includes some of the wealthiest uh, African Americans, um, uh, wealthiest African American neighborhoods in the country. Um, High Park, though, is considered working class with median incomes around 39,600. Um, and uh, at that level, as you can imagine, uh, the affordability crisis is a real issue in this community. Uh, the new Metro uh, CLAX line currently being constructed down Crenshaw Boulevard, which is one of Los Angeles' major arteries as well as um, an area that is synonymous with blacks in Los Angeles. Uh, the stop at Slauson and Crenshaw, the heart of Hyde Park, uh, will return this community to its stature as a key transit hub. And, uh, and of course, the community is really praying that they will be as present for the opportunities brought by this new development as they have been for the challenges in their community. Given all of these changes, this area is ideally suited to work with LA Commons. 
as we focus on leveraging the power of art and culture in raising the visibility of local stakeholders who have as a goal laying claim to their changing neighborhoods. We bring together interested parties everywhere we work, and in this case, in addition to Metro and the local council office, we worked very closely with HOPE, or Hyde Park Organizing Partners for Empowerment, and Park Mesa Heights Neighborhood Council. Um, and we'll hear from uh, Asada Umoja from HOPE uh, later on, and she'll talk more about their role. Um, and there were many other community organizations involved, businesses and schools, all with an interest in making Crenshaw Boulevard and the streets um, that um, uh, uh, run through the neighborhood really reflect the people that live there. Um, we worked together to hire our tremendous artist, uh, Moses Ball, and a team of young people who led their community in a storytelling process and are transforming these narratives into a highly visible work of art. I'm going to transition to Zipporah now, who's going to talk more about the Metro and what's happening with that system. Hi, uh, this is Zipporah Yamamoto, and uh, I'm with the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, uh, LA Metro, and we work throughout the entire county of Los Angeles. So while Los Angeles um, is a city, the city of Los Angeles is also within a larger sprawling county. Um, and LA Metro designs, builds, funds, operates mobility solutions for the entire county. Thanks to recent tax initiatives supported by over 70% of LA County voters, our county's transportation network is rapidly expanding. And a moment ago, um, you saw a map of our rail system, our current rail system. So we're focusing on rail today because that is, uh, that is uh, related to the project that, that we are discussing. Um, and there are many rail lines under construction and many more that, that were not included on that map, which seems to have actually dropped out of the, the slide deck, uh, that are still in the planning phases. Today we're going to focus on the Hyde Park community. Uh, the major transportation challenge and the opportunity are one and the same here. It is the major transportation and infrastructure improvement taking place along Crenshaw Boulevard that Karen spoke about, uh, the construction of the eight and a half mile long eight station Crenshaw LAX transit project. The new rail line will extend service from the existing Exo line and will travel through LA's historically African American neighborhoods of Baldwin Hills, Summer Park, Fairview Heights, Inglewood, Hyde Park, El Segundo, providing a much needed north south connection to the LAX airport. Completion of the new rail line will reassert Hyde Park's importance as a transportation node, providing Hyde Park, Hyde Park residents with greater mobility as well as employment and education opportunities. The line off also offers folks from outside the area the chance to experience one of LA's special and historic neighborhoods. At the same time though, with the connectedness that access to public transit will bring to Hyde Park, also comes the very real possibility, and, and we're seeing some of this already, that real estate near the light rail line will become more attractive to investors. While the potential impacts of gentrification are difficult to address, Local conversations and connective engagement are needed around this topic. The coming rail line and the accompanying station have created an opportunity uh, where we were able to engage residents and increase the chances for equitable outcomes as public and private resources bring a large infusion of capital. Creative placemaking, or more accurately, in this case of this project, placekeeping, has been a critical tool. What you're looking at now on the screen is a rendering of a typical at-grade or street-level station. While there are four at-grade stations on the eight station Crenshaw LAX Transit Project, the Hyde Park station is the only street-level station on this specific rail connection that will travel through the city of LA. The remaining at-grade stations on this line are in another city, the city of Inglewood. As the train arrives above ground from either direction, 
Riders will be able to look through the train car windows and see the heart of LA's African American community. The station itself reflects Metro's system-wide station design approach, contemporary architectural design, a streamlined palette of materials that will hold up well over time, and importantly, something we have implemented based on feedback from people who use the system, a consistent approach to design, signage, and wayfinding that helps people identify the stations that they're looking for. We know that this design approach will help people recognize the metro system, and we also want to be sure riders will understand the significance of the destination as they arrive. Our collaborative placekeeping pro project has been one key element in creating greater visibility for the history, creativity, and vibrancy of the Hyde Park community. To accomplish this goal, uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned before, we engage a very enthusiastic uh, group of partners, including the leaders of HOPE and Park Mesa Heights Neighborhood Council, who really took ownership of the project it ensured it was grounded in the community. Um, and that en enabled us to engage a very locally connected uh, team of artists and youth. Um, you see our artist, Moses Ball, in the right-hand corner uh, being videotaped. Um, and um, uh, over 100 residents. Uh, from grassroots leaders to our local councilman, who's in the top left, uh, the project was deeply embedded in the community. I'm going to turn it over now to Asada Umoja, who also served as our youth mentor, um, ensuring that young people who participated were connected to the project and the community and underscoring this intergenerational uh, 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 aspect of the project that was really a hallmark um, and one of the great successes of the project. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I, I'm glad to be able to share with you some of my uh, thoughts about the, the project and um, our work with the project. The first thing I want to say is that um, this project was definitely not something that uh, the Hyde Park community welcomed. Because the way the project was brought to our community was uh, actually an imposition. The community actually wanted to have the train go underground. And there was a vigorous fight, you know, to make sure that the train actually went underground. Even though 70% of the people voted for it, the people in Hyde Park who were going to be impacted by the train coming above ground waged a vigilant fight in order to get the train to go underground. As a result of us having lost that fight, we had to deal with the fact that now, now the train is coming above ground. And it has been uh, very disruptive to the Hyde Park community. It has uh, also at the same time, it has, um, it has been uh, an unsightly project. It has caused uh, a lot of, um, what should I say, um, uh, there's this, uh, there has been um, uh, safety hazards in the community as a result of the construction. There has also been, um, um, there has been uh, just downright, there's been dirtiness and ugliness. The way the whole construction project has proceeded has been a major problem. And so, um, having had an opportunity to really talk about that, even the, the whole way the, that the uh, artist selection was done, uh, did not really truly reflect what the Hyde Park wanted. So I'm, I'm happy that we have had an opportunity uh, with uh, MTA for them to actually hear the community voice and to actually see what the community really would like to see. Okay, um, we uh, actually have been involved in helping to uh, bring the community together around looking at making sure that our story is told, because we do have issues and concerns about um, the way the construction has been done, which has really been a demoralizing, been very demoralizing to the community. So having had an opportunity to actually um, talk about this and to actually talk about what the community would like to see and to have some type of restorative uh, work done, 
with the art project is really a, 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 a fantastic thing. Having had the opportunity to be able to actually get um, choose the artists that would actually reflect the history and the art, the history and the culture of Hyde Park has been good. Having had an opportunity to have the local youth involved has also been uh, a good thing. And um, it has given the community voice to actually be able to speak to what it is that we would like to see. But the primary issue and concern I also like to address too is that with the train coming, see, uh, Crenshaw Boulevard was basically what you would call a scenic highway. And so now what we have as a community is um, iron and rocks uh, and coming down, irons, rocks, and still coming down our scenic highway. So in order for us to be able to sort of balance that, we need to be able to put something there that truly reflects, you know, what we would like to see, or to, to, to give a, uh, at least a semblance that our community is still there, you know, uh, to recognize that there has been a, uh, there, uh, a community there that there were actually, I think, about 75% black businesses along the corridor, small businesses, and with the construction, what has happened is that a lot of those businesses have had to close down and move elsewhere. And in terms of the uh, opportunities, that we are still working to create more opportunities for the community to actually be able to benefit from some of the construction that's going on because if you look at the construction, you don't really see our community represented in the construction. In addition to the fact that um, it's been difficult for, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the businesses to survive, and even the opportunities for the funding to support businesses has not been the way we would like it. So with all of that being said, again, I go back to why it has been so important for the community to actually have voice, working with the neighborhood council, because the Hyde Park um, uh, Organizational Partnership for Empowerment actually came into existence after the 90, 1992 revolts. And the whole idea was to ad address the negligence in the community, the lack of investment in the community. And so with one more, uh, uh, an, another uh, project coming through that didn't really hear the voice of the community, to have this particular project in our community that's actually hearing a voice of the community and actually uh, giving uh, uh, an opportunity to express the art and culture of the community we're happy uh, about that. Even though we still have a lot of issues to address in terms of uh, employment opportunities, in terms of housing and all of those things, this gives us, again, uh, something to be able to see, something to look at that gives the community uh, some hope, not just some hope, but also gives us an opportunity to be able to um, build on what is there and to begin to continue to uh, work for the improvement of quality of life. And I feel, um, I feel um, uh, actually very uh, honored that we've had an opportunity to bring our youth to the project, to have our community hear the stories of the community, talking about what we'd like to see, you know, um, how we'd like to build our communities and to have had that artwork, um, those stories actually, actually uh, formed into stories. We actually had a story summit back in February where we brought people from the community to come in and tell their stories, to talk about their concerns, uh, not just about what we'd like to see, but about what was currently happening. Because we had some people who were in wheelchairs and stuff who couldn't even get around. But to be able to talk about what we want to see and how we'd like to see our community and the fact that we want to remain in our community, you know, was, a, was an excellent opportunity. And so the, the young people actually did, uh, we had like about 15, we worked from 15 to 20 young people that have really come together with the artists and actually created a mural. And we're looking forward also to uh, a second part with uh, Destination Crenshaw where we'll actually see some additional work along Crenshaw Corridor that will reflect also the community in that area and also be an uplifting, um, an uplifting, uh, something uplifting for people to be able to, to see and to look at and to know that we still have presence 
and that there is still opportunity for us to to build. But um, again, uh, I uh, oh, then the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we've been able to work with our our local bank. Uh, U.S. Bank has worked with us because we've worked with the community since 1992 after the civil unrest. We've developed relationships and partnerships with um, different businesses and organizations in the community. And myself, our, uh, our organization, along with the Neighborhood Council, was able to talk to U.S. Bank, who knows our history in the community. And they actually gave us the wall right at the corner of Crenshaw, which is sort of like the heart of Hyde Park, where everybody will be able to see it. And so we feel that this, again, will be something that will uh, give people an opportunity to see that the community is still here, that we're still working, and that we're still building. Thank you, Ms. Sada. Um, uh, in terms of our uh, reflections and um, lessons learned, I mean, I, I don't know that I can really add. I mean, Asada really underscored this idea of empowering the community. And one of the things that we did was we took, we supported the community in going on a site visit to Little Tokyo, which was struggling with similar issues around uh, community change. and. That was an extremely valuable experience, I think, for us all, both in terms of the information exchange, but recognizing um, you know, peer learning as an extremely valuable uh, way to promote community empowerment. Um, and uh, you know, the affirmation of the community has been uh, incredible in terms of their, the foundation that's laid for them to do further projects and really assert their claim on Crenshaw Boulevard as it evolves. The, finally, our capacity as an intermediary has been strengthened um, as a result of you know, providing support to organizations that are um, you know, so interested in community change. We partner with community organizations all the time, but to have this level of engagement and be able to support that um, you know, we are able to go in other neighborhoods and, and uh, apply the same uh, lessons from this project. Um, yeah, one of the, I did, there's something I did want to mention, um, and that is that um, besides uh, Crenshaw, Crenshaw being a scenic highway, and in addition to, um, with, with having the bus, the, the train come down the middle of Crenshaw Highway, there. I think that there was uh, some things that were were over overlooked, and that is is that along Crenshaw Boulevard we really had a pretty uh, well regulate a, a, a pretty well supported transportation system. We had like buses that went in all directions that took us from like um, different ends of, of the city, and so again like having this railway come down the middle of Crenshaw Highway the middle of Crenshaw Boulevard has, has really seriously been a, dis, uh, a disruption to our community. So I, I think that as we look forward and we talk about um, community and building community, one of the things that we really want to assert is that community uh, has to be uh, engaged in a way that they feel um, acknowledged as well as being supported and at the same time actually having opportunity, real opportunity, not surface level opportunity. Um, again, um, the, the project has been helpful in that area, just in terms of uh, beginning to um, at least hear, to hear the voice of the community. And uh, this is Sapora. I just want to follow up on, on those wise words from Asada, um, particularly the community uh, needing to be acknowledged, supported, and to have real opportunities. And I would say that really gets to the heart of this project mm -hmm. and our collaboration together. Um, for us, you know, as an agency, to have several months to really collaborate closely with community leaders and uh, community arts organization with deep history in the area 
on the development of an artwork that is so much more than an artwork itself, um, but really a landmark that lifts up local voices and asserts a very significant presence along the corridor has been truly special and will have lasting impact for a long time. Um, I'd say another lesson learned uh, on our part is that you know one of our goals at, at our agency is really to facilitate opportunities for artists at all, mm -hmm. all stages of their career. Mm -hmm. And so the mentoring aspect of this project with Asada's leadership has been very valuable. Um, and the transmission of history and culture to young people and to have the stories collected mm -hmm. from the people in, in the community and have that made visible in this mural is extremely significant, especially given you know, uh, some of the controversy around this line that Asada spoke towards. Um, in the past, when our agency has done work like this, uh, deep work in a community, we've really focused on that specific corridor community. And with this project, we learned something really new um, with a, a visit to leaders in Little Tokyo, an exchange, a knowledge exchange between leaders in Little Tokyo and Hyde Park. We've seen how valuable that knowledge sharing can be, especially because we know that construction impacts are very disruptive and can be for a significant period of time. So that kind of knowledge sharing between leaders in various communities is really important. And we're thinking uh, here in our offices about creative ways that we can help facilitate similar knowledge sharing between communities across LA County during various phases of transportation project development. Great. Um, uh, so is. next steps, um, most immediately we're focused on completing the mural and then um, adding additional artworks that um, integrate with the mural along Crenshaw, as Asada mentioned. Our um, uh, visionary council person, Marquise Harris Dawson, is, is uh, leading an effort to create an outdoor museum that tells the history of African American Los Angeles along Crenshaw, um, again, with this idea of claiming space. Uh, for the community, and it's a major initiative being designed by Perkins and Will involving uh, African-American artists from throughout the city, and some of whom are globally recognized, um, as well as early stage artists. Um, and so it's an exciting uh, opportunity for the community, and we hope that um, based on the work that's done in this project, the involvement of both elders and young people, it's laid the foundation for future community art projects that are part of Destination Crenshaw and beyond. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, we know we went a few minutes late, but thank you to all of you who were able to stick around. We can see how many of you are still logged in. Looks like most people were able to stick through, so that's a testament to the great storytelling that all of you were able to put into your presentation, so thanks again for that. Um, I also wanted to thank Sophie Schoenfeld, the other half of the arts and culture he team here at Transportation for America, and of course the Kresge Foundation who funded our work on the Cultural Corridor Consortium, as well as all the work you just heard about um, over the last hour plus. Uh, we will be sending some follow-up emails to everybody who joined us, as well as those folks who registered and weren't able to join us, with a link to the recording of the webinar and in the near future, a blog post which has an even more expanded um, telling of the story of these projects. As you can tell, there's even more than we're able to fit into this hour-long webinar. And a few of our presenters reference videos. We'll have all of those up on our website as well. And then in the slightly more distant future, we'll have a couple more webinars coming up, one focused on our state-of-the-art transportation workshops, and um, another focused on our brand new artist in residency program, as well as a couple others over the next coming months, so stay tuned for all of that. And thank you again for joining us. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to all the questions, but we'll include the questions that many of you asked in the blog post we put up on our website soon. So thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you.